welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We are, uh, inshallah ta'ala, hitting the ground running with Ramadan at this point. Uh, before I get started, inshallah ta'ala, with our wonderful guests, I wanted to remind everyone, bidnillahi ta'ala, not just to go to the Yaqeen website, the link, and, and donate, bidnillahi ta'ala, to Yaqeen amongst the very worthy organizations and causes, inshallah ta'ala, that you donate to this year, but also to check out the resources, alhamdulillah, I mean, the uh, Quran 30 for 30 ebook from last year's season, which was a sira focus, and then the season before, which is just an overview of the structure of the juz. Uh, the du'a book by Sheikh Tahir, hafidahullah ta'ala, the du'a book by Dr. Taslim, hafidahullah, the uh, convert resources by Sheikh Abdullah Uduru, hafidahullah, mashallah, we got a lot on there, alhamdulillah. The videos, I hope that you're keeping up with the Judgment Day series at Suhoor and keeping up with this at Iftar, and a reminder to invite others to join along, inshallah. And a reminder to take notes. Subhanallah, the first two, uh, the first two sessions of this uh, really were mind blowing. Honestly, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, the insights that were shared by Sheikh Abdullah and then Dr. Taslim and Dr. Uthman were really, uh, were really moving. And so, to capture that, inshallah, with your own notes before we make the ebook for next year, inshallah, uh, is actually a good thing. Now, today we have a, a, a serious treat, alhamdulillah, because we're trying this new format, which is going to be a few times, inshallah, ta'ala, with uh, with having two guests um, and inshallah ta'ala that just means more richness uh, to the juz. Uh, I'm going to shorten my part inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah, I'm not going to tell him to shorten his part because he might beat me up if I tell him to, to, to shorten his part. But... Yeah, I'm no, right in the not... corner, man. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, alhamdulillah, uh, Ustad Ruhi is very well known to us. Alhamdulillah, written a lot of the papers on Teskiyah and some of our most most meaningful papers on repentance, on shukur, on gratitude. Subhanallah, taking those Teskiyah concepts uh, and and giving them to us. So Ustad Ruhi, we're very happy to have you once again. Welcome to Thirty for Thirty. Alhamdulillah, Very happy to be here. Pleasure. And Alhamdulillah, Ramin, Dr. Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed Khatir, uh, our new senior fellow at Yaqeen, who. Uh, I personally have a lot of admiration and just a lot of a lot of love for it. Alhamdulillah. But I mean, I've never got to spend as much time with him uh, as I as I'd like to. But uh, we share some of the same teachers. Alhamdulillah. But I mean, of course, Sheikh Sheikh Salah Hassawi, Hafidahullah Taala, and and others. Uh, he is a graduate of Al Azhar, of uh, Berkeley, of uh, the Graduate Theological Union, uh, professor in Islamic law. And Hanbali jurisprudence, uh, so one for the Hanbalis, you know, Alhamdulillah, but I mean, a pure, pure Hanbali scholar, Alhamdulillah, and also uh, works with Amja, Mishka University, Guidance College, too many things, but I'm, I'm just going to pick on the Amja part for a moment, Sheikh. Have you guys announced uh, Ramadan yet? Um, yeah, Alhamdulillah, we're fasting, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... I love Amja, and this is a we're we're pro Amja here, but but sometimes those announcements need to be a little bit smoother, Shay. Sometimes they need so we're just we're gonna use this as an opportunity. First and foremost, <laughs> opportunity okay. make a formal request to to get the Ramadan and Eid announcements on in a good time. Hamla, this time is a good time. Another another question for you, uh Sheikh, is is it okay to lift as much weight as Sheikh Abdullah Aduro lifts? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it shows, mashallah, even in the video, mashallah. <laughs> so, Sheikh Ahmed is covering the ayat, uh, ayat uh, from Surah Al Baqarah, some of the last ayat of Al Baqarah today, and then the rest of us are going to be doing some ayat from Surah Ali Imran. So, we're going to go in order, inshallah ta'ala. So, Dr. Ahmed, we're actually going to start with you. Inshallah Ta'ala today. So Hafidak Allah take us take us away with the Bismillah. Bismillah Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillah was Sarat was Salamu Allah Sayyidina Rasulillah wa ala alihi was bihi manuala hu taba huda tumma amma ba. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our gathering here today solely for his sake and approve for us, not against us on the day that we meet him. Allahumma Ameen. this juz talks about a very serious matter that is relevant to all of us living in the modern world, especially in the West, and that is the issue of riba, usury, interest. And usury or interest is from the major sins, and it's from the seven destructive sins. The Prophet ﷺ told us to avoid the seven destructive sins. And when he was asked, what are they? He mentioned shirk, he mentioned 
witchcraft, and he mentioned killing a soul whom Allah has forbidden to be killed. And from those he mentioned is riba, consuming riba. And the Prophet ﷺ also, he told us that he saw two men, and one of them was swimming in a river of blood, whereas another man was standing on the bank, was throwing stones at the man. Every, every time he tried to get out of the river, the man would throw a stone in his mouth and force him to go back into his original place. And whenever he tried to come out, the other man would throw a stone in his mouth and force him to go back to his former place. And so when it was asked, you know, who is this? It was said, this is the person in the river was the person who consumes riba. So dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, this is not a light matter. This is a matter the Quran is filled with many different gems. From them are the legislations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about consuming riba and the rulings concerning riba and the warning against this. In this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us about the bad ending of those who consume usury. You know, those who consume usury, they cannot stand on the day of resurrection except as one who stands being beaten by Satan into insanity. When resurrected, when they come out of their graves, these people will be like those who are insane or possessed. Why? This is because they said trade is like inst. Trade is like usury. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted trade and he has forbidden interest in usury. Look, look at what they said. Look at this rejection of Allah's legislation. And, and we as Muslims, we need to reflect and remember here. We need to pause here and reflect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise. And he knows what's best for his creation. And he knows what benefits them and benefits his servants. So he allows it for them. And he knows what harms them. So he forbids that from them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must believe this, is more merciful with his servants, with the creation, than the mother with her own infant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never asked about what he does, while they will be asked. And so we need to pause, dear brothers and sisters, and remind ourselves, as Muslims, we should be sufficed by Allah saying, Allah has permitted trade and forbidden interest. Khalas, the command of Allah and his messenger should be enough. We are slaves of Allah. And when the command comes, we say, we hear and we obey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers to fear Allah and leave off interests if they are believers. So subhanAllah, let's take a pause with this. Allah is telling us, O oh, believers, fear Allah and leave off interest if you are believers. So let's pause here and see. If we're not giving up interests, then we have to reflect on the deficiency of our own iman our own faith, and our own fear of Allah. Allah tells us, all you who believe, fear Allah and give up interest if you are believers. So if we cannot give up interest, then there's something with our faith as being believers. There's something wrong with our iman, and there's something wrong with our fear of Allah that we have to check. And in the hadith, everything pertaining to the days of jahiliyyah, day, the time of jahiliyyah, the day of ignorance, the Prophet said, is under my feet, abolished. And from that, the usury of jahiliyyah is abolished. So when Allah tells us to leave off riba, and when the Prophet says tell, and tells us, it's under my feet. So we have to ask ourselves, is the halal not enough for us? Why do we still go after it? Yani, subhanAllah, some people think that riba is that which will make them successful in this world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the opposite. Allah tells us that he destroys interests. And he gives increase to charities. He destroys interests and he increases charities. And Allah destroys interest either by removing that wealth altogether or depriving them of its blessings. So trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is not your way to success. People say the modern world, capitalist society, this is the way to get to the top and get successful and wealthy. No. Allah will destroy interest. That riba will be a source of problems for you. Sin, punishment, torment in both worlds. It's not going to be success for you. In fact, the one who does not leave interest, subhanAllah, Allah himself, Allah has declared war against, war against this person. If we do not leave off 
of interest, then Allah tells us, be informed of a war against you from Allah and His Messenger. Yeah. If this verse doesn't make your heart gonna, you know, burst out of your chest out of fear, you know, is this verse is not enough to just stop you right in your tracks? And what what is? And it was reported that Ibn Abbas said, it will be said to the consumer of riba on the day of judgment, take your arms for battle. <laughs> can you imagine who can go into battle against Allah? Yani, this is a frightening, frightening thought that this could be something that happens to me or you or anyone. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. And of course, there are other verses in this regard regarding riba. But knowing this, dear brothers and sisters, knowing that Allah has permitted sales and forbidden usury, and knowing about the severe warning against usury, it is important for the Muslim to know what are the matters that makes transactions problematic and what are the things we have to be cautious about? So we can summarize generally and say quickly that inshallah what is most correct is that the default concerning contracts and conditions is permissibility and validity unless proven otherwise. Now, the re reasons then that would make transactions problematic in Islamic law, we summarize them into the following. Number one, riba. And we talk about this. And riba can be broadly categorized into usury of sales and usury of debts. And usury of sales can be further divided into usury of increase and usury of delay. And the usury of debts can be divided into usury of loans and the usury of jahili. And from the differences between these two major categories is that the usury of sales occurs in the six usurious items mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and it includes the items that share the same effective causes. Whereas the usury of debts is not restricted only to those items. So number one, the first thing that will that'll cause problems in our transactions is riba, and we talked about that. Quickly, and we're almost done, number two, gharar. We can translate this as undue risk-taking. Undue risk-taking is another issue that can cause problems with transactions. So selling something that does not exist, or, or that which is not available, or that which can't be delivered, or that which is unknown or that which is not specified or selling items in risky ways and so on, this falls under this category. But gharar has conditions for it to affect the validity of a contract. Gharar becomes impermissible when it's a large amount. However, if it's a small amount, it could become permissible. Also, if gharar is the primary matter of a contract, it becomes impermissible. But if it appears as a secondary matter, it becomes permissible. And a need can make contracts with gharar permissible, a need. Um, and gharar can be overlooked in volitional contracts uh, as opposed to contracts of exchange. So that's number two, gharar. And finally, oppression, wronging others. This will also affect an, uh, the validity of contracts and, make, and cause problems to your transactions. When a party oppresses uh, another party in a contract, uh, either by trickery or taking advantage of them or hiding defects, or taking another person's business opportunity and the like, then this causes problems in the contract. And the Sharia has legislated options for rescinding uh, these contracts when these things happen. And the details of all of this uh, can be found in the books of uh, law. And of course, there are details and differences amongst the scholars regarding what we just summarized. But that quickly gives us a taste about how the Sharia is perfect in what it has allowed, in what it has prohibited to maximize the benefit for the creation and to minimize the harm for the creation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the firm path and to make us content and pleased with the halal and to keep us suffice with the halal and not make us want to go to the haram. Allahumma ameen. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Ahmed. So subhanAllah, my part will actually build on this quite a bit. I actually will go right into the beginning of Ali Imran. And it's very much so connected uh, to this idea of riba. Why? Because when we talk about the ways in which people would uh, skew the message, right, in order to, to fit certain things, the way that people would play with religion, uh, subhanAllah, that shows probably none so more than with riba. And I'm not just talking about when it comes to the usury uh, which is which is so, you know, and I think Sheikh Ahmed has sufficiently <laughs> conveyed, subhanAllah, how grave of a matter uh, riba is, usury is. And in, 
you know, it's not just with that in the ayat, it's also in the in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu is talking about that punishment and the Prophet Sallallahu also in his farewell speech, right? And so if you think about how prominent it is and how people would use it to continue the, uh, the harms that were done with it, uh, you know, subhanAllah, one thing that we find of the, uh, th that, that particular uh, picture of a person that is being thrown back constantly into a river over and over and over again with the punishment, with the stone. Uh, riba and jahriya was used to bury people in their debts. And of course, that's still the case today. And usually the people that suffer from being buried in debt, it becomes a slavery of sorts. And you constantly are attacking on and on and on and on these higher rates. And it just makes it so difficult for people to ever catch up. And those that suffer will always be the poorer of society. And those that benefit will always be the elite of a society. So it's a severe matter for sure. And you see the playing around with that concept in religion. And I just want to, before we get into these particular ayat, uh, you know, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is an ask to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not burden us beyond our scope, right? And many people would think, well, it's really hard. And we shouldn't think that it's to burden us beyond our scope. We should see ourselves, inshallah, though there will be exceptions to certain rules uh, with some of these transactions, especially when you live in certain societies. We should see ourselves as people that are not just seeking to convenience ourselves and make things comfortable for ourselves, but also to replace uh, things that are not permissible with permissible alternatives for all of society, as that brings about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and greater ease. So when you're asking Allah at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, after the, this, this, this ayah of a deen, of, of debt, and the, the prohibition of riba, the prohibition of usury and interest, uh, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to burden us beyond our scope. Now, historically, as we said, people played around with financial transactions. And this is where religious corruption can first start to show itself either collectively or individually. So obviously what I've been doing is I've been looking at these different verses from the perspective of the hereafter. So if you go to the beginning of Ali Imran, uh, you have these verses uh, that show up in the very beginning, verse 8 and 9, I believe. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ O our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate after you have guided us and grant us your mercy. You are indeed the giver of all bounties. So think about what this is building off of. Your first ask in the Qur'an was, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hudan lil muttaqin. This is guidance to the people of piety. The, and, and piety and God consciousness naturally is going to lend itself to some level of caution. So it leads to Hudan lil muttaqin. And then after that, it becomes Faman uh, tabi'a hudaya, or, or uh, you know, we talk about the hypocrites, of course, Aladina Shtaru Balala Tabil Huda, those who purchased misguidance with guidance. And when Adam السلام, and Hawa are expelled from the garden, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ Whoever follows my guidance, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ they will, not have, they will not fear, uh, nor shall they grieve. So here's where the beauty of the Qur'anic coherence really comes in. What is the dua here of these righteous people? رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Oh Allah, let our hearts stay firm. Let them not deviate after we have received guidance. Sheikh Abdullah Duru spoke about this, and uh, I don't know if it was yesterday's session or the one before, but this idea of not guide us to the straight path, but guide us to it, on it, within it, keep us firm on the path of guidance. So this idea of guidance being that precious, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Do not let our hearts deviate after you have guided us. وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَنْدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ And grant us from your, you know, your mercy, and you are indeed the giver of all bounties. Now, listen to this part. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ جَامِعُ النَّاسِ لِيَوْمٍ لَا رَيْبَ فِي O oh, our Lord, you will certainly gather all of humanity for a day in which there is no doubt. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ Verily, Allah does not break His promise. Surely Allah does not break His promise. So this is really a beautiful part of this that I want you to focus on, inshallah. And if you're taking notes, in Al-Baqarah, it started off with, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي 
This is the book in which there is no doubt. This is the book in which there is no doubt. Okay. Now we mentioned after that, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned those who believe in al-ghayb, those who believe in the unseen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hum And the part of the unseen that he specified was the hereafter. So Allah in Al-Baqarah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ la رَيْبَ This is the book in which there is no doubt. And here in the dua of the believers is this beautiful verbalizing of يَوْمٍ la رَيْبَ Okay? That you are going to gather us on a day in which there is no doubt. So they have no doubt in the book. They have no doubt in the day. And what that leads them to is to abide by revelation as it was intended. Right, not looking for ways to skew the revelation. And what causes people to skew the book, right? What causes people to skew the revelation, except that they want more of this world, except that they, they want to find loopholes, right? And exceptions. Well, why would they want to find loopholes and exceptions if they had such certainty in a day in which there is no doubt, where you know adherence to the way of God is going to be the most beneficial to a person and the most profitable of all trades. So it's actually a very powerful build up to this point that then leads us to subhanAllah this conclusion that these righteous people when they're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they say that they're thinking about the day of judgment even, even as they are making their du'as. And I just thought of that subhanAllah Sheikh Ahmed was talking about the, the, the situation uh, which, by the way, Sheikh Ahmed, you 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 preceded me in one of the episodes that will actually be in the Judgment Day series, where we talk about the situation of the people of riba, uh, the people of interest and usury in that sense, the people who steal. Um, that's actually part of the episode that we've already covered. Uh, the financial transactions, the idea of property burdening people on the Day of Judgment. Uh, we talk about this in the Day of Judgment series, right? Property that you didn't pay zakat on, property that was stolen. And that which was dealt with in haram transactions when it comes to riba and financial transactions. So again, if you have complete certainty in the book, there is no doubt in this book. And you have in Ahli Imran, a day in which there is no doubt, then you're not going to skew the revelation in a way that puts your day, the judgment day, okay, at risk. For some material gain in this world. I'm going to say this again. If you have no doubt in the revelation, and if you have no doubt in the day, then you're not going to skew the revelation for some cheap worldly gain that puts the day in which you have no doubt at risk. So the believers are between ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه and the believers are between اليوم لا ريب فيه a day in which there is no doubt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove all doubts from us and allow us to only deal in that which is permissible and that which is pleasing to him and allow us to be rewarded for all those things we abstain from in this world on that day in which so many people will be looking for good deeds. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumallahu khayran. I think inshallah ta'ala now we will move on to Ustaz uh, Ruhi. I think you're, you're next inshallah. Jazakumallahu khayr. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so actually, I'm going to build on some of what we've already heard um, today so far, in that when we really look at, you know, everything connected from the end of Surah Baqarah and the discussion of riba and then getting into um, Al-Imran and this juz in general, one of the themes that, that we see throughout this surah is um, the concept of so many different kinds of fitna, of tests, um, different uh, aspects of the dunya that just, you know, have people behave. We see different categories of people responding in different ways to tests. And in the midst of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, singles out a group of people, the same group of people that Shah Omar was just referring to, the muttaqeen, the people of taqwa. And, you know, we hear about obviously, and we know, and we're focused entirely this month on the concept of building um, taqwa, that caution in, in how we approach our life. And this ayah that I've chosen is ayah number 17, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singles these people out and shares with us the qualities that really, the characteristics and, and actually the way that they embody 
um, these characteristics as a way of life uh, to really kind of show us what it is to, to live a life of taqwa and how it is that we can navigate through these tests in life that are really the reality of life. This passage that um, precedes ayah number 17 uh, talks about, you know, the, the, the lore of the dunya and the things that, that man and that we are all attached to. Of course, some of these things are blessings. We all want provision. We all need to have companionship. But at the same time, um, there's a point at which it can also be, become a fitna, a test, when the balance is skewed, when that sense of not keeping an eye on the certainty of that day of gathering is lost for even moments. We we can fall into into traps and tests, and of course, um, this is uh, the way, inshallah, in these attributes that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us, that we can almost take a methodology and and a personal conditioning, a mindset, to try to find our way um, to a path of, of not only pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and living a life of taqwa, but ultimately to success on the day of judgment. Um, one thing I want to mention, I'll mention the ayah first. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the following words um, to describe these people. He says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, as-sabirina was-sadiqina wal-qanitina wal-munfiqina wal-mustaghfirina bil-ashar. That uh, those who are He's referring to, again, the people of Taqwa who are patient and steadfast, and they're truthful and truly devout, um, and they seek forgiveness before dawn. So they wake up in, in, in the early hours of the morning to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this is, you know, there's these amazing qualities that we all aspire for, and we know that these are things that are pleasing to Allah uh, to, to embody. The sequence here is something that I kind of, wanted to reflect on for a moment, um, that when we embark on this um, effort uh, uh, and we strive to find this taqwa in our lives and to live this cautionary approach, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to make it easier and easier for us when we approach him. It's up to us to take that first step, but we'll see how each of these are connected together um, briefly, inshallah. And along with this conditioning, I want to just stress that the way these are um, worded here, these are actually all, they're describing people and qualities of people, but they're verbs. That means they're actions and they're to be implemented. Um, sabr is something you, you, you're in action constantly, even when you're patient and steadfast, you're, you're, sometimes it's restraint. Sometimes it is staying consistent and going the road. So when we're, um, you know, we know we need to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there'll be times when something may, we may face something that is, very difficult for us to um, to do. We find it challenging to be consistent with with a particular act of worship uh, or something obligatory. Then that steadfastness is where the sabr is. But also in knowing when to refrain, when to hold your mouth, when to uh, when to not reach for something that would potentially lead you to something that can be harmful or sinful. Um, all of these things are part and parcel of having this quality of, of sabr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, for these people, um, there is there is Jannah. The people of Taqwa will ultimately have something far better, as he says just before this ayah. That you know, tell them about something that's far better than anything they can accumulate in the world. And obviously, we're living in times where temptation is all around us. So even in the face of temptation, um, in the face of of um, you know delay where we're doing the right thing, we're making du'a, but we're not seeing results. Um, the, this is where patience and steadfastness can help us. Then the next truthful, to be um, truthful is a manifestation of upholding that faith that you're declaring, of, of maintaining that that tawheed in every aspect of your life. To look at, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran in the beginning of the surah, furqan, al-furqan, that it's, it's the criteria that should help us to distinguish truth from falsehood and to to stand by that is the person who is truthful. Um, the person who's fully aware, a number of times Allah mentions that nothing is hidden from him. Um, just again, just before this ayah, he mentions he's fully aware and watchful over his servants. And so in that regard, um, we see that these people who are truthful, they'll be truthful to themselves and they'll be truthful to um, to those around them. They'll behave with integrity, with justice, with courage. All of these manifest as a result of having that, that truthfulness as part of your character. Um, and it's the means of making those right choices, of overcoming even fear and weakness to do the right thing, as we see the Sahaba in, in this surah and around the events of Uhud. Um, the, the next one is to be 
devout. Um, this is a word that has so much depth to it, but essentially I want to just hone in on complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your ibadah, in your soft heartedness, in, in being able to maintain, um, you know, that sense of, uh, you know, complete uh, devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your worship, um, a means of increasing our iman of, of, and that certainty that we need to remind us all the time of that day that is coming, that day of judgment that is coming, and of the things that we can't see, that is al ghaib that we, the muttaqeen, believe in, in, in the things that they cannot see, right? Um, and so this is something that will enhance that and will allow us to, to reach that. Um, it is also uh, the spiritual balance we need because we are constantly hit with the things of the dunya around us, these tests and challenges and temptations that are coming at us. This is the spiritual balance, really being able to um, take the worldly aspect of our life and add the spirituality to, to be able to say, okay, I can make the right choice given a particular test or a particular situation. I'll turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put my trust in him and really trust in, in the outcome. Um, I'll wrap up quickly here as the time is going. Uh, in regard to spending, if you look at these previous qualities that were mentioned, patience, steadfastness, um, being truthful. That's what it's going to take to have the mindset to be able to spend in a way that you're spending for that day, for the reward on that day, and not just because it's something I know I have to do or something that I, you know, may Allah protect us, do just for the sh for the for the show of it or to to get accolades for it. And so it is actually a manifestation that one has that tawakkul in Allah for the reward that is to come and requires that patience and convictions and subservience that we've talked about. And the last one is the people who wake up out of their sleep to seek happiness in the early hours of the morning. And this is in many ways the most powerful manifestation at the end of this that one can almost see these as steps that build to that level where the deep connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there in being able to talk to Allah while recognizing one's fallibility that I'm still going to make mistakes as I strive on the path to develop this taqwa. And the beauty of istighfar and seeking uh, forgiveness is that what do we get from istighfar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised the bounties of this world as well as ultimately the bounty of the akhirah. And that's something that when you look at all of these qualities, um, I was reflecting on it just this morning that we talk a lot about trusting in Allah and tawakkul. Um, just as, uh, you know, Shah Abdullah was saying the other day in context of, of we believe in Allah and talk about believing in Allah, but do we believe Allah? I loved that. That was just one. In this case, I was thinking about it, that we talk all about tawakkul and trusting in Allah, but do we actually trust Allah? If we take that step of being, you know, take that pause to say, what do I need to do and to develop and walk along to see this as a ladder or steps that we're, we're pursuing to, to reach that, that day when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we see the results of all of this. Um, may Allah make us amongst the people of Jannah that istighfar actually in all of that, Allah says, I'll make it easy for you and I'll give you the dunya too while you're, while you try. So just strive for it. So may Allah make us amongst those people. And of course, the reminder that every night, not just in Ramadan, Allah comes down to the last the lowest level of the of, of the heavens to look for us to to, to ask of him. So may Allah make us of the people who do that. Jazakumullah khair. So just a quick recap, Sheikh Ahmed, what verse did you cover? Because people are just so people taking notes. So what verse did you cover number wise? So we did uh, Surah Al Baqarah 275 onward. Okay. So Surah Al Baqarah 275. I covered Ali Imran uh, 8 and 9. Uh, Sister Ruhi, what verses did you cover for Ali Imran? It was 17. 17. Excellent. And now, Sheikh Abdullah, Bismillah, take us away. Last but never least, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> I will be covering the chapter of Al Imran, our verses number 30 and 31. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is talking about something that's very pertinent to uh, what we've been talking about. As all of the ayat, ha ayat the verses have some level of tadakhul and a connection between the two, whether it's a generality or something that is specific. I want to talk particularly about that day when we will go in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will be presented with everything that we have done in this life. Keeping in mind that subhanAllah on this day, whatever is presented is presented by Al-Adl. It is presented by the one that is the most just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we talked about before in the chapter of Al-Fatiha, we mentioned five names in this beautiful chapter. 
And it's important for us to understand that all of his names and attributes are complete and perfect and they do not. It's impossible for them to be imperfect. Number one. Number two, that they have a level of a tashabuk or tadakhul, that they all have some level of connection between the two. So, for example, Allah is al-Azim. He is the magnificent. He is the grand. There is nothing that is greater than him. Well, his samir, his samirhu azim, his hearing is azim, that there is nothing that is greater than it. And he is uh, al-Rahim. So whenever he is merciful, we say al-Rahman, al-Rahim. We know that his judgment, his judgment, his judgment, when he judges, when he chooses something, it is couched in mercy. It is couched in love. It is couched in justice. So with this beautiful verse that we see in the chapter of Al-Imran, verse number 30, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us about him in earlier verses in chapter, in verse number 28, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he warns you about himself. He mentions in chapter in verse number 30 where he talks about that day. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this day. May Allah protect us and make us victorious on this, on this day. Yawm al-Qiyamah, as Ismail ibn, ibn Kathir, ibn Umar al-Khathir, he says, rahimahullah ta'ala, that this is Yawm al-Qiyamah. This is the day of judgment. This is the day where you will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yunabba'u al-insan yawma idhin bima qaddama wa akhar. As Allah says in another verse in the Quran, that they will yunabba, they will be told, they will be given the news. Insan, all of mankind, bima qaddama wa akhar. What has been put forth and what has possibly been delayed or that which is uh, delayed in, in, in essence. So seeing here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, as he says, the day that every soul will find what it has done of good. Min khayrin muhdaran, and it will be presented. Wa ma amilat min su, and what they have done of evil. This is interesting here. Let's pause here for one second, for a couple of minutes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that there will be a day. And as the scholars mentioned, Tahir bin Ashur mentions in Tahrir, and his tafsir, a Tunisian scholar, rahimullah, mentions that Allah is concentrating on the day, particularly because he starts off with yawma, the day. It is the object, mansub, it is the object here showing that the day is what is important to remind you that there is a day. Maliki yawmiddin, that there is a day. We should feel a level of accountability now, not when we are sick or not when we feel that the time is coming because of our age or whatever the case may be. You never know when Allah will take you. So it's reminding you of that day that you will find uh, every soul shall find what they have presented from good and from evil. And there's different understandings of this, whether it's the good that has been presented to you. And when you think of this good, you see it's presented. You're asking, oh, Allah, please do not present this evil. I hope this evil is far away from me. Or both of them will be presented to you on this day. And then what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here in the second portion of this verse, do that they wish that between itself being the evil was a great distance. Being that when you see this good, you hope that the evil that may be presented that is coming or that it doesn't come is far away from you, that you are totally disassociated from it. Whether it is you have been forgiven for it or there's some type of expiation that you, another person, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven, as there are many different types of expiations from you, Allah, or from others. In any case, Another type is where both of the actions are presented. That your good deeds, صغيرها وكبيرها, the small and the big of them, the great sins and the major minor sins, or and the, 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 the good deeds. So the good and the evil deeds will be presented in front of you. Yeah, what do they wish that between them and their evil deeds was amadan ba'ida, a great distance. And amadan all 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 already means something that is distant. But ba'idan is a surety that I wish that I didn't even see these deeds. As a matter of fact, I wish that I would never have done them, the level of nadam and regret. So seeing here that subhanAllah, wood is an intense love or desire. On that day, you will have the desire and wish, oh, I hope, that between me and these evil deeds is a far distance. I am totally disassociated with them. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes here, وَيُحَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسَهُ وَاللَّهُ رَعُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And Allah warns you about himself. Allah warns you about himself. And what is so beautiful here is as uh, is mentioned in uh, Tafsir Baqa'i, he mentions that uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala muntaqim wa minma ta'adda tawruhu wa nasiya annahu abd. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has vengeance upon the one that forgot his or her position being a servant in this life and forgot that they were a servant. They thought that all of the good comes from them, that they are the repository and source of good. But at this day, they wish that they could turn back. They wish that their evil deeds would be far away from them. So this is an incentive and a reminder for us that now is the time to act. This month of Ramadan, take advantage of all the good deeds that you can, for you don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you and where we will all be in front of him and our evil deeds and our good deeds will be presented. We don't want to be the ones where we hope that our evil deeds will not come in front of us, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any of our shortcomings and allow the shortcomings to be a means for us to ask for forgiveness for really, inshallah, after his mercy, they will not be presented as evil deeds, inshallah. I mean, Jazakallah khair, Shaykh and Shaykh Abdullah. So what verses again, if you could repeat the number for? Uh, chapter of Al-Imran, uh, verse number 30. 30, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, as you're listening to the Quran being recited tonight, inshallah, you're reciting in your own. Uh, mashallah, so many beautiful insights uh, between our uh, three wonderful uh, guests, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. May Allah reward you all. A reminder to everyone that is uh, tuning in, please, inshallah ta'ala, go to the link. Uh, we ask you to support Yaqeen, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. It is through your generosity after our gratitude and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his bounty. After that, uh, the way that you have invested in the work at Yaqeen, which is always free and accessible to the public, please continue to donate. Please benefit from the resources that are there, the accumulation of these resources over the last few years, inshallah. And in closing, inshallah ta'ala, Sheikh Ahmed, when is Eid? That's a good question also. All your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so M just follows moon saying. So we're going to find out when it is. And so there we go. All right. I'm just, I just wanted to see you smile, Shaykh. That's all it is. That's all it is. Well, it was wonderful to have you. Astad Ruhi, is it still snowing in Chicago? Was this morning. Hopefully not now. Long it turned into rain, snow, snow, something. I don't know. It was sleet in between. Yeah. So is it safe to say it's never Eid in Chicago? No. <laughs> no, we love we love our Chicago folks as well as just there. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless our community in Chicago, a hub of honestly amazing Islamic institutions. Alhamdulillah, I mean, a hub of amazing seminaries, places of ilm, uh, masajid. Uh, we we love it, mashallah. And Sheikh Abdullah, uh, when are you coming to visit me at VRIC? You live around the corner. Are you busy in Capel? I'm busy at the Islamic Center Capel, man. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayran once again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa